All right, let's get back to it. Oh, oh, there you are. Thanks for letting me know about the time last week. Um, I really hate it when professors go right up to the time. So I actually usually try to be five, 10 minutes early even. So, um, you know, mea culpa, what can I say? All right, so uh, let's get back to it. Uh, so we were talking about uh, the evolution of the term hacker or what constitutes a hacker. Um, and um, this is a mixed class and 226 is still a really new course. But this year I decided to have students read the Hacker Manifesto as part of their first assignment, kind of so that I could use them as a canary in the coal mine to kind of take the temperature on what people who ostensibly are new to the field kind of think about that sort of mentality. And unsurprisingly, well, I mean, I was surprised, but I guess I shouldn't have been. Um, the prevailing opinion in the class, not for everybody, but in general seemed to be very similar um, to what kids like the mentor faced in the late 80s. Uh, most people thought, you know, this kid's an edgelord, and this is angsty teenage shit, and, and that's true. I mean, it was a teenager, so it makes sense. Uh, but um, prevailingly also was a sense of, well, this kid's entitled, what gives them the right just because they can do something to do something. And in reading the responses, I think that right about here where we left off last time, in the 90s is where that idea really comes from. Because back when the manifesto was written, um, computer crime was a thing, but it wasn't very common. And most of the public perception of it, as we talked about last time, was kind of whipped up into a fervor from moral panics of the 80s and everyone being scared of crime in various different capacities. But truly that sense of, what well, I guess if you could say a sense of entitlement that definitely crosses the line into something malicious, if it were to be found, it wouldn't be really until the 90s. Because as we talked about last time, the majority of computer criminals that were convicted before and directly after the passage of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act were mostly crimes of curiosity. You know, kids who didn't really generally mean harm, but were definitely going in places and doing things that people did not want them to do. But with Kevin Mitnick in 1995 and a few other before him, you can see just if you look at the rap sheet that there was definitely a shift at some point there. This is now the 90s. And again, the internet pre-1994 is very different than the internet after 1994. Because before 1994, it was still more or less a place that was this burgeoning sort of unfamiliar territory and no one was really taking advantage of it commercially. In 1994, that changed when Pizza Hut sold their first pizza online and everyone started getting into the game. And when that changed, money got involved. That means there was additional scrutiny. There was additional attempts to regulate and control uh, flow of information on the internet. And it also means that cyber criminals now had financial incentives to be attacked as well. And when Kevin Mitnick was taken down in 1995, that's precisely what he was doing. There's a really big difference essentially between the Morris worm, which took down 40% of the internet, but it was just kind of him tagging ARPANET just to see how far his code would go out of curiosity and taking credit card numbers and using them to you know, buy computer equipment and uh, Mountain Dew and Cheetos and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Kevin Mitnick did do time and he did eventually get out and became a, an upstanding member of the, uh, the discipline. But this is where that, that, that thought pattern goes. These, <clears throat> these kids taking shortcuts um, and using their skills for evil. And uh, I guess that's really the word, isn't it? Evil. We talked about uh, malevolent traits and malice and dark tetrad, which attempts in essence to quantify what could be described, I suppose, as human evil. But what ultimately does that mean? Well, in excess of those particular traits. Of course, there's the golden rule. Right? Don't hurt other people on purpose kind of a thing. It's one thing if it's a crime of curiosity that accidentally hurts somebody and something like what happened in the early 90s where people like Kevin Mitnick were using their skills and they didn't really care who got hurt because Kevin Mitnick at the time, and I'm not like denigrating uh, Kevin Mitnick or anything. Literally, if you read any of his books about this time, he says in his own words, 
that he never saw the sun. He chain smoked Marlboro Reds. He would sit there with Mountain Dew and Doritos uh, until six, seven in the morning, hacking into various different systems and doing things he ought not do. That was his life. Um, and that, you know, using those skills then to actually hurt other people without really caring, because during that period, he also had another often common trait with people who never see the sun and so on, which is nihilism. He didn't really care who he hurt, which as we talked about last week and a little bit earlier this week. Hurting other people because you simply don't care is a dark tetrad trait. That's psychopathy, right? But this was also a really exciting time as well. Because the internet, when it became commercialized, uh, was this weird thing. Because it was the first time that at least I can recall ever happening, which is a thing was built. And we talked earlier this semester about how no technology is spawned from primordial chaos. The internet is no different. It's a confluence of various different projects, all with different aims of reducing various different types of human work, like decentralized communication platforms, quickly emailing uh, or sending messages across long distances, lowering transaction cost of phone calls and text messages and so on. But after they were developed and made available, no one else really knew what to do with it. <laughs> you know, It was one of those things where it's like, sure, we have it. And there's potential here. Everyone could sense the potential. But how do we make use of this? And it took a while. It took almost the entirety of the 90s uh, to really kind of figure it out. This was uh, what you might be called uh, the Web 1.0 days. 1995 would be like CompuServe, Prodigy, and then AOL. The first browser is just out. Um, we're still talking VBS. We're still talking Usenet. We um, don't really have the bandwidth for um, visual media so much. I mean, this was the days when uh, downloading a single picture might take 60 to 180 uh, seconds or so. It would take a while and sit there and wait for it. So um, this is also the time when these companies see this and sense the potential and they want to get on board. And Web 1.0, of course, ramps up to eventually what became known as the dot-com bubble. So basically what I'm saying is it's kind of a perfect storm. You've got some people who have advanced expertise in the technology, will understand how it works. Law enforcement, that does not. Other parental figures or authority figures that do not. And corporations that are eager to get their hands on that dirty dollar. And so are taking way too many risks in order to get in on that space to the point where it eventually creates an economic bubble and that bursts, as we now know, looking back. <clears throat> so perfect storm, and this is where the term hacker really starts to get a bad name. Um, we also talked about uh, the concept of script kitties last time. So script kitties is a derogatory term uh, within the cybersecurity and especially hacking communities, which essentially denotes somebody who has a low level of competency and skill, but they know just enough to be dangerous kind of a thing. It's like if you were to um, put them in front of, let's see, you can give them access to whatever tools they want and put them in front of another system and, and say, attack this target. Uh, they won't even know where to begin. But if you give them something that's prepackaged like AOL or low orbit ion cannon or something like that, and uh, they'll know just enough to cause trouble. This um, gets a bad rap for various different reasons. Um, among the underground subculture of hacking, um, this term has negative connotations because it denotes somebody who, as we talked about before, does not know things. It's all about what you know and what you can do and the skills you have and, and all that, much more than about your actual age. So the kiddies part of that is really more about uh, you know, the sweet summer child, inexperienced, floundering around kind of kitty, not necessarily about age specifically. because there's some very, very young uh, and very talented hackers that come out of this age as well. Um, and in cybersecurity communities, actual legitimate cybersecurity communities that developed after this, the term has a negative connotation because it's something that terrifies us for various different reasons. Like for example, which as a cybersecurity professional should you be more worried about? If you have an industrial control system that's part of the energy sector, let's say controlling um, production of an oil pipeline, or something like that. Are you more concerned 
with the expert who knows how to get in, rifle around, and do exactly what they want to do, no more, no less, or the script kitty who runs something, gets in, and then starts tracing around like a baby Huey or a bull in an elephant, uh, a bull in an elephant shop, bull in a china shop. <laughs> bull in an elephant shop would be a very different thing. I'd pay to see it, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, uh, somebody who's going to don't know what they're doing and then they accidentally take down the whole production environment. So obviously both are bad, uh, but if I had to choose, I'll take the surgeon uh, over the sledgehammer, please. So this becomes the first time this really is a big problem, uh, is around the late 90s or so, and um, continued to be a problem up until, well, we'll get there, about 20 years or so. Now, also in the late 90s, and again, the Matrix, just one year away from release, we're all waiting for it. We start to see hacker collectives forming and the involvement now of governments as well. So it took the entirety of the 90s. Business gets on board first in the mid to early 90s. Once business got involved, the government could get involved because the government, more than anything else, its purpose is to regulate commerce and enforce contracts. So prior to business getting involved, it was really hard for governments, including law enforcement agencies, to find pretext to actually police the internet. But after that, it became so much easier. And then it became difficult again for other reasons we'll talk about when we get there. But now that it's the late 90s and business is involved, now we start to see governments getting in on the game, starting to do their own form of regulation. And of course, taking advantage of this new technology as well. And this is when cyber warfare begins. And a lot of people will point to, well, cyber warfare, that's a thing that's, you know, North Korea does or something like that. Maybe like a, like a late 2000s or early 2010s kind of a concept. But no, uh, it's been since about the very beginning. Even a lot of the early systems, the systems that we now use regularly in cybersecurity are actually born out of low-tech versions that were developed during the Cold War in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, Multi-factor authentication for example, is just a high-tech digital version of what Cold War agents were doing in espionage known as a one-time pad all the way back in the late 50s and early 60s. Essentially, random number generators with a secret that's shared between two parties, and then they could literally broadcast messages on open airwaves that anyone could listen to with absolutely no fear of decryption. Has anyone here ever heard of numbers stations? Yeah, a couple of you. It's not like the kind of thing I expect everyone to know, but it, like maybe appeared in an episode of X-Files or something. I don't know. Um, it's one of those weird urban legend things that uh, you'll hear people talking about on like the Dr. Demento show or something. Um, because they're eerie is why I say that. I can play you a sample here. They're not hard to find because again, they're broadcast over public airwaves and people scrutinize them all the time. So they record them and wonder what sort of alien crap is this? Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So if you tune in on AM and FM channels, usually on the fringes between frequencies or, uh, or little traveled uh, frequencies AM because you can broadcast and bounce it off the ionosphere and, and go even farther with the broadcast. But over open airwaves, any radio can pick up, you'll hear stuff like this. And again, people hear this and it's like, well, that's eerie and it's weird. And sometimes they'll have names associated with them. Um, like for example, um, American number stations might start with a little jingle. It sounds like a MIDI file of like Yankee Doodle Dandy or something like that. Or um, British number stations might start with some other like uh, uh, sea shanty or something like that. And it's just to essentially identify the station for the people who are listening. And who's listening? Well, uh, there's no speculation necessary, Dr. Demento aside because what those are simply is somebody at a base station attempting to communicate with an asset out in the field in secret. And it just broadcasts numbers. Those numbers signify letters, but you can't decode them unless you have what's known as the one-time pad. 
which is basically randomly generated numbers and you increment and decrement based upon the numbers that were produced is the exact same thing that your hard token, your cell phone or your key fob does with a server with multi-factor authentication. It's just a high-tech version. So um, the cyber warfare thing was not a late 90s, early 2000s or, uh, or early 2010s type thing. That's just when it really came to be the major issue, I suppose, at the forefront of all things. So we even see it all the way back here um, with state actors getting involved and um, trying to make use of these new burgeoning technologies and these communication sections. And also remember, of course, the whole cyber warfare aspect in addition to that is that a lot of these early computing programs were government projects, sometimes specifically for the military in order to offer, like for example, decentralized communication platforms in the event of nuclear holocaust. So of course they're using it. Um, in the late 90s, however, is when we saw our first sort of open to the public, bald-faced sort of cyber warfare operations when um, in heightened tensions in the Persian Gulf, the US Deputy, Deputy Defense Secretary John Hamm uh, called the most organized and systematic attack on US military systems to date, an attack by a hacker clique. They had developed a Trojan, which they had made available. And that of course gave access to tons of people to do so. And as I mentioned before, they chose to release this at DEF CON because uh, at the time, there were no responsible reporting avenues. Uh, the choices were basically, you could announce it at DEF CON um, or you could just keep it to yourself. And that was about it. There was no bug bounty programs. And at the time, if you were to try to responsibly disclose by contacting the organization, in this case, the Department of Defense, and told them that you found a vulnerability, you were more likely to be arrested than you were to be rewarded. So there wasn't a lot of incentive for responsible reporting in any other fashion. Um, yeah. All right, so the year 2000s, <clears throat> we're finally here. So the uh, 90s gave us essentially the individual operators, the uh, black hat hackers, um, who were using their skills for their own personal gain kind of thing, where the, the connotation of hackers with the black hoodie and the sunglasses and everything comes from, which, I mean, I would say that it doesn't persist today, except every time I look at any media that has anything to do with it, that's what, the, that's what you see. So apparently it does, but it really comes from those days. But those days were fairly short-lived, kind of like the uh, um, legends of the Wild West live on in American memory, despite the fact that it comprised about a five-year period before the invention of, uh, or before the uh, second industrial revolution. One of those things, it's, uh, and it's indelible, burned into our collective consciousness. But it was short-lived. By the time the 2000s rolled around, the era of the individual motivated attacker was all but over, uh, partly because uh, state actors got involved and started tightening their security, although we didn't quite yet see a cohesive response. Although, spoiler alert, in the early 2000s, something happened in America that would quickly change that. Um, but what we see instead is now um, it's the anomaly of the hacker collective becomes a necessity simply because of the scale of attacks increasing in response to those individual attacks. We also see some of the um, major technology firms, their um, lack or lax cybersecurity being laid bare. The early 2000s was a really embarrassing time for a lot of major technology firms. Um, the uh, dot-com bubble at this point is, I think it hadn't quite burst yet, although for some places, like some industries, um, like for example, PetSmart, no, that's a big box store when I think of pets.com or something like that is a survivor of those days, but they had no fewer than, than uh, eight competitors at the height of the bubble. Um, and of course, now these days, everything's about subscription box services that get mailed to your door. It's the next bubble for sure. Especially since supply, supply chain issues make that problematic. I think. So anyway, I'm getting anyway, focus. Okay. So uh, the early 2000s, really embarrassing time for a lot of big tech firms. Uh, Windows in the years before that had been seriously embarrassed by a series of vulnerabilities that ended up with 
fairly major consequence in terms of compromise. And uh, now a time when there's more scrutiny on them than ever. And Microsoft promises, uh, uh, they pinky swear that they're gonna start taking security seriously with the release of their next few major OS versions, which <coughs> to their credit, they still, uh, they made good on, uh, but Windows is still Windows after. Um, we also begin to see big widespread attacks on infrastructure uh, because the dream of a decentralized communication platform that led to the development of the internet was a great thing, a gift to the world uh, that would endure in the event of even the most costly of attacks on our infrastructure. Uh, that is not really great for business. Uh, telecom companies who at this time are facing an end of life problem with their analog telecom systems. Uh, now they know that the internet is going to replace it. And so we start to see the merger of major tech companies with traditional telecom companies like well time work. Um, so that is dying, um, though not going quietly for sure. But what that led to is a consolidation of infrastructure. This decentralized platform, which was designed to be decentralized, well, now all of a sudden the telecoms, they wanted to do exactly what they did with the analog telephone services. They want to have junction stations. They want to have, they want to own the pipes, the series of tubes, as Al Gore said. They got to belong to somebody. The downside of that is it creates bottlenecks and bottlenecks are vulnerable, particularly to denial of service attacks. Um, like DNS attacks or, um, well, really any denial of service attack. Bottlenecks are bad for all of that. Um, then of course, it's not on the slide because it kind of goes without saying, but 2001 also brought about a big change in our posture on security. 9-11 uh, happened. Spoiler alert. And when that happened, uh, the government response was fairly swift and comprehensive. Mostly, however, uh, not in cybersecurity. So if you, uh, if you don't remember, if you weren't taught the history on 9-11, on there were most definitely cyber components to that attack. They used sites to, for example, sign up for uh, airline flying lessons and communicated across international borders using email and various other sites. Um, Al-Qaeda, they had a web front page where they were accepting recruit applications and stuff. It was a really weird time, but it was all there. But uh, here in the United States and abroad, we were hardly alone in not really having any ability to respond or deal or even consume any of the evidence that may potentially exist out there. I mean, it was acquired and eventually analyzed, but making quick use of it wasn't really a possibility back then. And so as part of the response for 9-11, the government's comprehensive plan did include some measure of cybersecurity response, um, or at least the ability for law enforcement to begin conducting investigations uh, into cyberspace. Um, it basically loosened restrictions that had already existed is really what it amounted to. However, the, the bulk of the response at the time was in more traditional policing methods. So um, information sharing among, well, the creation of the Department, uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, information sharing across law enforcement networks of closed source databases, um, Intel um, sharing up, sharing down and out, which hadn't previously existed, although it definitely should have. And then the funneling of funds to hire new officers and. Uh, tanks and body armor and stuff. And this is when the role of police went from a community policing model to domestic terrorism security. <clears throat> and uh, all of the cybersecurity stuff that was in there was at the time really more or less lip service because the Bush administration had quite a few irons in the fire and it just wasn't one of their priorities with all the other things going on. So they mentioned it, they included it in legislation, but they didn't do much in the way of actual practical um, improvements on our national cybersecurity posture just yet, but they did lay the groundwork for it. Um, so uh, that's got to start, it's 2002. This is when cybersecurity, nobody really was talking about in the, in the, up until this point. It was one of those things where if you were to talk to people who had been working in IT, you know, they would say, oh, it's not a big deal. Just use strong passwords, don't be stupid, and, and you're fine. You might have those individual administrators who know a thing or two about their systems and the security that's available in them and stuff. 
Uh, but after 2002, it, I mean, after 9-11, it really drove home, if nothing else, how important this was going to be. I know that all of you probably don't remember, well, some of you may remember a time before 9-11, um, uh, but most of you don't. Um, and it's impossible really to explain or describe in any way that can actually be appreciable um, how that changed the American psyche. It was the first time that we had been attacked on our own soil by a foreign actor. And that was a really big deal. It really changed the game. So whereas before the attitude was more of a complacency, like yes, um, security of all kinds, including cybersecurity is an important thing. We definitely ought to be paying more attention to it, but you know, bad things could happen, but they probably won't. And, and it was kind of ignored. But after that, with that change, uh, it became clear that it was critically important because if a foreign actor or a domestic actor, for that matter, um, wanted to take advantage of vulnerabilities in our cyber infrastructure, they could, and there would be very little to stop them. So at the very least, the groundwork had been laid. Now, of course, um, we saw no slowdown in terms of what are known as APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats, another name for state actors generally. And in 2004, North Korea bragged uh, about creating an APT of 500 trained members and uh, began targeting South Korea, Japan, and uh, pretty much anybody else who had systems connected to them. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned it here because it's an important milestone because it's the first time any nation state had officially claimed the responsibility uh, for any such attacks. Because typically in terms of foreign policy, this would be a pretty major no-no. Um, but uh, in the early 2000s, another thing was happening in terms of the internet. Web 1.0 was dying because it was being replaced with Web 2.0 which meant all sorts of new capabilities that came about with you know, broadband internet access and, and all that stuff, particularly the rise of social media and stuff. But in general, um, the communication platforms that people were using were changing. Let's put it this way. Um, the most significant change of this time is probably not social media itself. It is the search engine. Because prior to the early 2000s, actually finding information on the great repository of all human knowledge was actually really difficult. You had to use link rings, right? You had to find a site that was in the ballpark and then see if there were any uh, links on their links page that led to that, or maybe search through Usenet or BBS systems in order to find a URL or something that you could actually visit. It was really hard to actually find information. So while, of course, social media and streaming services and all that stuff that, that gets a lot of attention, um, well, again, it's what we were talking about. Oh, sorry. No, that was 226. Um, we will talk about data information, knowledge, and wisdom later on um, in more detail. But suffice to say that the early internet was all data. We could not actually find enough data at times to convert it to information. So we kind of had to just do our best. But the early 2000s crossover with Web 2.0 essentially meant that now we could actually convert data to information because we could easily parse it, sort it, search it, and consume it. It was a major change in the way things that worked. Now, how does that relate to uh, North Korea finally uh, being the, one of the first nation states to actually claim responsibility for attacks? Okay, so it matters because in addition to now being able to operationalize and consume uh, data out on the internet, it also meant that you could essentially use the internet now for the first time as a large broadcast platform or as a propaganda tool. So it became immediately apparent to those nation states that you could get a message out there and it would matter. And sometimes the effect of that propaganda outweighed any potential foreign policy snafus that may result therefore or thereof. And North Korea in the early 2000s had virtually nothing to lose in terms of its foreign policy posture and everything to gain from effective propaganda. All right, so uh, here we are 
halfway through the 2000s, 2005. And this would signify really the end of the individual hacker as an independent operator sort of phase. Um, the dark web is now a thing. Um, hackers are operating still mostly out in the clear net. Everyone familiar with these terms, clear net, dark web? Okay, good. Um, so they're operating out on the clear web, but they also are dark websites where they're congregating and sharing information and posting carding information and stuff like that. Uh, one that was available on both was what was known as Hell or World of Hell. And it was run, it was a very prolific hacker forum. Um, the closest analog I could give you that you might be familiar with is like raid forums in case anyone got shut down. Um, but this was on the dark web, so it was even worse. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so it was a prolific, it was a, a place where many, many people congregated um, and eventually it was shut down. Um, I have Rafa here, Rafael Nunez. I included him on this list because uh, he was arrested at the airport on his way out after hacking into uh, DISA systems. Uh, at the same time, or wait, this was April 2nd, so. July. Yeah. July that year, uh, the forum's main moderator uh, would also be arrested and that basically shut down that forum and many others. It was a, uh, like the takedown of Kevin Mitnick, it was a concerted effort by law enforcement operating on US, right? Um, we also uh, see essentially, I'll cut to the chase. Uh, here in the mid 2000s, what we're seeing is an end to that era because what we have is law enforcement by this point, it only took them 15 years, but they eventually got there they found a way to effectively fight that type of cyber criminal. What they would do is they would essentially go to places where these people would congregate like World of Hell or infiltrate various different groups, it's similar tactics that they would use uh, during the, the Red Scare days in the 50s when they thought there was a subversive group. They would infiltrate that group, they would collect intel, they would turn members internally, and when they had enough information to make an arrest, they would bring the hammer down all at once on everybody. Um, so that's what we saw. And this brought an end to that because it became very difficult for these people to operate uh, and they could no longer trust the groups that they were in. So it effectively brought an end to this era. Um, DOS attacks uh, were a major problem. And so the FBI focused a lot on that. Operation Bot Roast uh, found over 1 million botnet victims. Um, it continued to be a problem for the next five or six years or so, uh, but mostly because uh, by the time 2007 rolled around, we had effective means of fighting botnets, but it took a good couple of years due to the cybersecurity process and infrastructure being in its infancy at the time and not having good ways of centrally pushing it. This, um, this is a time when every AV engine had their own in-house developed signatures. So there really was a difference between running um, a vast and Kaspersky because they would literally have different signatures. These days, that that's that doesn't really matter. Honestly, there's no difference between AVs. Just get the one that doesn't uh, fucking try and sell you something um, because all of the signatures all come from central repositories and they're shared. And the reason that they're shared is for faster response for stuff like this. There's already a two or three week lag at best. So um, having a central repository is better than the five or six years that we see or used to see. Social engineering, uh, however, takes the place of DOS attacks in the forefront of our minds as professionals. Uh, a fear, which would persist essentially for eternity, um, but it became the new thing we were worried about. And we did not really have at the time any good ways to fight it, which I know now it's the answer is obvious, you know, security awareness training and exercises and that kind of thing. Uh, but there was major resistance to that, and there still is, despite its obvious importance. Um, we see what few individual actors that are still out there. Um, the kind of, the, those that were still operating went two roads. They either went underground and kept picking off small fish, uh, or uh, they wanted to go down in a blaze of glory and started picking really big targets, like the United Nations. But no longer being able to operate 
um, alone and no longer being operate, able to operate in groups where they were all known, there was still one possibility for remaining effective in terms of conducting black hat operations. So here at the end of the 2000s and the beginning of the 2010s, we have the next rise in what would be termed a hacker or what we considered a hacker. And we see the rise again, or I shouldn't say the rise again because it had been around, but this is where hacker collectives come back into the forefront. This worked when groups didn't work because these hacker collectives essentially maintained OPSEC by not really knowing each other. It would be groups of people and they would retain anonymity even internally amongst themselves. Now we're gonna talk about a couple um, specific cases here. It didn't last very long. Eventually the FBI did figure out how to fight this type of cybercrime as well. But this is the era when that was a thing. Um, in 2008 is when Anonymous, the hacker collective known as Anonymous, uh, took on Project Chanology, uh, which was an attack on the Church of Scientology. Now, I just, just said a moment ago that this era didn't last very long, but Anonymous is a special case. It's actually still around, and I just saw yesterday uh, that there was a threat made against the government of Iran by Anonymous. That said, Anonymous suffered tremendously during this era, which we'll talk about in a second. But Anonymous happens, and they're in the news all over the place. There was a good three or four month period where everything you saw in Ars Technica was related to Anonymous. It was bizarre, especially since it started as a 4chan joke. We also see uh, Chinese hackers now. North Korea uh, taking uh, responsibility for cyber attacks was a shock, um, but in foreign policy circles, it made sense. But a couple of years later, China would actually claim um, a, an attack on their own, a direct attack, as a matter of fact, on the United States military industrial complex. Now, North Korea felt safe doing that when they did it, taking claim uh, responsibility for the attacks, because in terms of foreign policy, they had very little to lose. This one was a lot more puzzling to us, and it signified to anybody who wasn't in that information stream uh, that there was a lot more going on behind the scenes than we knew about, right? So essentially by 2008 at this point, with Chinese, American, Israeli, North Korea, Russia, all of them. Uh, occasionally having stories pop up or um, strange rumors that you might hear somewhere online, it, it became clear that there were major operations being conducted, major operations that could indeed disrupt real life uh, systems. Uh, also notice um, the center of the hacking world at this point is not China or Russia or America as it is now, uh, Turkey around this time, but they'd fix that by clamping down with their own cybersecurity laws in a little bit. All right, so the era of the single hacker attacker is over, but around this time, there's, there, there have been relatively few psychological studies of um, hackers and what makes them tick, but criminologists have studied it pretty extensively. And at this point, during the late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, several studies concluded to allow us to reach certain conclusions about offend these offenders as a type. And what we found with subsequent arrests and future studies on um, certain attackers who belong to these hacking collectives, like Null Crew and Lulzsec and Anonymous later on, uh, we would find that they still matched this, well, well the, the, uh, not this, they still matched the profile that had been created by these studies. But that does change later on. So what, who are these people? What kind of people are they? Are they the um, downtrodden, the, the smart, sensitive kids who just don't get along with people, maybe neuroatypical? Uh, who find solace and, and escape in computers, or had they changed at some point? And the answer is they definitely had. 
most certainly. And this is a pretty good case study for us because this takes place in Wisconsin and that's where we happen to be too. So we have a cyber criminal here, a computer criminal, a cyber criminal, both as a matter of fact. This individual is responsible for 28 plus power failures and 20 other service interruptions at various Wisconsin power plants causing almost a million dollars in damages. He also branched out into non-computer crime by attempting to burn a sauerkraut factory down. He's an avid urbex, that's urban exploration. So abandoned places that essentially were at one point active and part of human habitation or, or commercial or industrial purposes no longer required and left sort of to fester in the urban hellscapes that remain. Uh, I'm talking about Milwaukee, by the way. Um, so, uh, but that is uh, usually illegal. Usually those places are condemned and you're not allowed to go into them. So that is a deviant act that's breaking and entering and would pick locks to gain access to disused city property. Um, occasionally disrupted radio and television broadcasts, including emergency broadcast systems in Madison and Milwaukee. Disabled the air traffic control system for the airport. Damaged an internet service provider's computer system. Sold bootleg software regularly. And then skipped bail facing the above charges and went underground. So this is essentially a rap sheet for everything that they eventually got busted. This person was Joseph Kanapka, born in De Pere, 1976. So on and so forth, demographic information, white male, 1835, fitting the profile that we usually have for the prototypical computer criminal of this type. Uh, in criminology, there are usually different typologies for different offenders, and we delineate them according to various different criteria. This would be one type of computer criminal. So uh, fitting that demographic more or less perfectly, Dr. Chaos, this was before South Park. So. Unfortunate name in hindsight, I suppose. High school dropout, obtained a GED, was a systems administrator, but for some reason couldn't get along with others and ended up losing that job. Um, leader of the realm of chaos, a hacker collective associated with the 2600, and left his mother's home in Green Bay after dropping out and went to live with his grandparents in De Pere. So this is just the broad strokes. This is just the demographic information. Uh, you know, I suppose if we were to take a look at it, what we would attempt to do is to identify between what we know of their behaviors and what we know of them, even demographically, we would attempt to extrapolate what are known as antecedents, uh, essentially markers in history that may indicate certain behavioral characteristics. Like, for example, dropping out of high school and losing a job as a systems administrator indicates, you know, going against the grain, a potential problem with authority, I would say so. Um, a willingness, uh, to not abide by society's rules, willing to essentially do uh, whatever it takes and whatever um, means to whatever end they feel is important, and so on and so forth. He was eventually caught in Chicago. He had broken into the uh, service area of the um, Metro Transit Authority, and he was stockpiling the ingredients to make a cyanide gas, and he had been planning an attack on Chicago. When asked why he did it, he said, I don't have a good reason. He reported to be good with computers and bored with school, unchallenged by classes and uninvolved socially. A good, albeit troubled kid. I wouldn't be surprised if he had done something like that to kill himself because he thought his life was over anyway and persuaded others to join the Legion of Chaos with the motive that it was cool. That's the same pitch I give students when they're considering the cybersecurity program here. So I mean, you know, <laughs> app dev, cybersecurity is cool. <laughs> uh, his motive seemed to be mischief, cause some mayhem, and see how the authorities react, and a self styled supervillain. And like the mentor left the manifesto, old Dr. Chaos, more than happy to spill some ink for us as well.
Come on, Edge, you're ruining my momentum. Here we go. <clears throat> uh, this is the letter. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But if we were to take his very own words and compare them to the mentor's words in the manifesto, we would see some shocking similarities, right? Greetings from America's second finest facility. I believe the local constable area has rejected some of your correspondence. To contain, I'm sorry, maybe I'm not reading this in the right voice. Greetings from America's second finest facility. I believe the local constable area has rejected some of your correspondence. You can get the idea. He's got a certain style of writing, right? There's, there's definitely a certain arrogance here, but also intelligent, right? Just as the mentor was self-styled as well. An idea that doing things simply because curious, you want to see what happens, and so on and so forth. But what I'm getting at is essentially we had this germ, we had this seed born out of a new technology, a home for people who had no other place to go, who very quickly in the span of, uh, for example, uh, the development of humankind, barely the blink of an eye, had helped to, along with many others, transform the burgeoning technology into the cornerstone of our global culture, economy, local forums, and so on. Uh, the 2008 election, when Barack Obama was elected president, was the first presidential election that the internet really played a major role. The 2000 election I remember keenly and the only thing really the internet, I mean, the internet played a role, but it was more people would go to the news sites and you know, see what's going on with those hanging chats. 2008 election on the other hand, proved that things had changed uh, quite a bit. So back then we had this seed and the technology planted the seed in the technology, and we watched it grow, and it did wonderful things. But just like we saw when we were talking about uh, the munification of information, transmission of information, and the way that sometimes technologies can have unforeseen consequences, particularly when they are able to or must support ideas that we find undesirable as a society, that tree that grew out of that seed, we didn't even realize it, but it had a rot in it. And this is where that idea of the entitled computer criminal really comes from, because it grew out of that. These words aren't all that different from back then. The difference is that one of them was a kid who was curious about computers, and the other one is somebody who wanted to kill half of Chicago just to see how the authorities react. All right, we did touch on this. You all know about this, so we won't bother with that. Okay. So um, this time around the, the beginning of the 2010s, the 2000s was the era of the Hacker Collective. It came to an abrupt end with a series of major arrests in early the early 2010s. If you're not familiar with Anonymous, I'm surprised if you're not, but assuming that you're not, you know, not everybody will be. Um, they're not a traditional hacker collective. They were the first termed hacktivist group. So what Anonymous is, is a loose collection of individuals that just as with other cases of tribalization, we see different groups tend to gravi gravitate around certain individuals in the cult of personality. Naturally, leaders will emerge who will kind of become shot callers and lead the way. Although all of this is happening ostensibly, anonymously, and so it's kind of more complicated than that. But suffice to say that it's not like the other groups we're gonna talk about here where it's a dedicated core group. They are working together to achieve certain specific aims. Instead, it's more like uh, a toddler playing with a shotgun. Sometimes uh, when they get a shot off, uh, it was a good one. And sometimes they miss and hit grandma, right? So their um, history is really spotty. They have taken on some, some big targets over the time, as I mentioned before, in 2008 is Project Chanology, uh, which was done in a burst of self-righteousness and also for lulls, and that was the motive. But then also some rather high profile targets, usually also some misguided ideology of some kind. 
taking on major credit card companies or payment services or the Vatican or uh, law enforcement agencies and so on. The name anonymous comes from anonymous image boards, 4chan, 8chan, Overchan, uh, non-IB and so on, where if, you're, if you've never been to any of those, uh, take my word for it, don't. Um, I mean, <laughs> There, there are some bad places on the internet and then there's dumb places on the internet and those are both, so no redeeming qualities. Um, but if you're not familiar with them, they are characterized by an ephemerality and anonymity, which is not true anonymity anyway, but basically when you sign up, you uh, are just anonymous. You just post anonymously to the board. And that's all the description I'm gonna give you. So, they are identified, uh, as I'm sure you've seen in uh, news articles before, by the Guy Fox mask from the um, movie V for Vendetta, which is a graphic novel, but you know, just watch the movie. But this is what you see. So if you've seen this image, now the uh, imaging, the, uh, despite not having a clear leadership or hierarchy, the image, that uh, anonymous as a collective has left on the consciousness of, well, I guess the zeitgeist of what is a hacker. I would say the Guy Fox mask these days is probably just as synonymous with the word hacker as the black hoodie and sunglasses. Sometimes I play like uh, really terrible hacker simulator games and they'll have, you know, simulated tools and stuff that you'll have to run. And it's kind of a toss up whether or not you're going to get an icon that looks like this or an icon that has a padlock or uh, the black hoodie and sunglasses. So, very effective imaging despite not having a leader. Uh, they also have uh, certain other things that are associated with them, which I, which I will share with you simply because they are still around. So, this is information that might actually be useful if you don't know it. But you'll see uh, the empty suit with the model. We do not forget. We do not. For, uh, we do not forget. We do not forget. Expect us or similar symbolism. And this is the empty suit. And as I said, they are still around. They're they're at least threatening targets. However, in the early 2000s or sorry, in the early 2010s, uh, they too suffered from a series of very high profile arrests of some of their most prolific and talented members, which definitely slowed them down for the last, well, they, they have been nothing like they were in the early 2010s. Um, they're still around, they're still doing things, but uh, they're not doing quite as much work as they were before. And part of that, again, is because law enforcement agencies like the FBI changed their tactics to learn how to fight these type, types of anonymous collectives. Um, so yeah, I mentioned their goals. It's a loose affiliation of individuals. Their goals are basically entirely dictated by this cult of personality develops around certain personalities. Uh, charismatic individuals uh, essentially will become shot callers, just as we see in any other decentralized um, distributed cell type of criminal enterprise. Um, that said, although they have slowed down quite a bit, they are also, um, at least in terms of the numbers that we have, one of the longest lasting and most successful types of collectives, but that's difficult to say if it directly translates because anonymous is a moniker that could be adopted by any collective. And it's, and it's also possible for uh, members to claim responsibility for attacks that indeed none of them had any, any, any hand in at all. It's really kind of impossible to say how many of these 300 or so operations that are attributed to them are actually attributed to them. All right, there's more, but we're not quite here yet. So in 2010, two really big things happened in the world of cybersecurity, two big attacks. One of them was Operation Aurora, which was against Google. They had reported that they had been on the receiving end of a highly sophisticated and targeted attack on their corporate infrastructure and they came right out and said the quiet part out loud. At the time, there was a, an unwritten rule, a policy, if you will, the federal government did not like private organizations to announce publicly when they had reason to believe that a state actor was responsible for a cyber attack. The reason for that is because the federal government wanted to control messaging. They didn't want to accidentally interfere with counter espionage operations or intelligence gathering operations. They didn't want to essentially make their targets aware that they were even found out. 
right? Because that could put ongoing operations in jeopardy. But uh, Google by now, um, over the last 10 years, had become huge, nothing compared to what they are now, but huge. Um, and so it was a really big deal that they had been targeted by a, a nation state. So they said the quiet part out loud and came out and said that it was most likely China that had done so, although they would not just yet claim responsibility for any attempts. This is also significant because while everyone in the community knew that nation states were definitely targeting private uh, enterprises, private organizations, if you were working in the industry, you saw it all the time. Logs would be full of attackers from various different areas with clear signatures. It was not difficult to trace these back to various different persistent groups and from there extrapolate that it might be a nation state targeting an organization, particularly given what they were often going for was uh, things like um, sensitive information about people or proprietary information or R&D, uh, those kind of high value, but um, with a limited market type of data. Um, and then in June, is when Stuxnet happened. So if you're not familiar with the Stuxnet attack, it was a malware attack, but it was a carefully crafted and considered one. And when all was said and done, it was clearly uh, some kind of major play that might as well have been taken right out of a spy thriller now. So what Stuxnet was is <coughs> malware was developed. It was designed to spread via Windows computers, but only to actually negatively impact its payload was only targeted towards a certain type of SCADA system, a certain type of SCADA system that also happened to be employed by the nation of Iran in their nuclear refinement centrifuge systems. And what it would do is it would essentially override certain safety mechanisms on the SCADA system allowing the centrifuge to spin at dangerous levels until they basically destroyed themselves. They would spin themselves apart. Now, because Iran was the target of this, uh, most experts believe that Israel was behind it. Uh, spoiler alert, they were, but they had a lot of help from us. Um, what else? Oh, right. How did they get the malware onto these systems? They were thought to be unhackable because these nuclear refinement systems, of course, weren't connected to the public internet. That would be really dumb. They were thought to be very secure because they were air-gapped, so they were not connected even internally to any network. They were complete standalone computer systems attached only to the centrifuges. Well, what happened was is somebody, some motivated individual, placed the uh, malware on flash drives and then went to a restaurant near the nuclear facility and just left them behind. So guys come out on lunch break. They sit down to have some falafel. Oh, what's this? Somebody dropped a USB flash drive. There might be something juicy on this. There might be some nudie pics on this thing. I'm going to go to work and check this out right away. I can't possibly wait to see what's on this thing. It's exploiting. It's, a, it's at its core a social engineering attack, right? That's what it is at its core. You're exploiting the vulnerability of human curiosity. And that's a major turning point uh, because, again, this was thought to be an unhackable system. Uh, and a devastating attack, uh, one that wasn't just cyber warfare operations that was, you know, uh, shooting paintballs at each other over the internet or something like that. Uh, this was an extremely costly uh, disaster for Iran, I should say, uh, one that set their nuclear uh, program back um, years. All right. So here we are, still the early 2010s. <clears throat> we see uh, the rise of two other very prolific hacker collectives, not anonymous. Uh, one of them is known as LulzSec. The other one is known as Null Crew. The most prolific member of Null Crew was a computer hacker named Slink, S-L-1-N-K. Uh, who alone was responsible for some extremely high profile attacks. And that name will come up in uh, a couple more times here in these slides. We also see nation states, now that the cat was out of the bag with Operation Aurora, we see nation states now more or less openly attacking private sector organizations. 
They're receiving at this point some assistance from the federal government in terms of intelligence, um, because by now, with the Obama administration, the groundwork laid by the Bush administration followed through by the Obama administration into the formation of what are known as information sharing centers. Um, that, that was actually the realization of what the idea was back in the early 2000s. These information sharing centers uh, basically allowed for the federal government and other experts with threat intelligence to share directly to cybersecurity professionals in different sectors more or less freely. It was a major turning point because for the average Joe working in cybersecurity, finally, it wasn't just individual people in their own silos at their own organizations taking guesses uh, on what was going on or trying to figure out what was going on from reading the newspaper. Instead, there was a direct source of intelligence uh, that would several times over the coming years uh, avert many cyber disasters for our nation. So one of the biggest things that we have at this point now that we didn't have before is intelligence. Uh, and nation states now with intelligence from the United States are openly targeting private organizations like, for example, the PlayStation Network. Um, what else? Sony would be uh, shortly after. Uh, we have other hacker collectives rising at this time, uh, like, for example, the Impact Team that took on Ashley Madison in 2015. Uh, we have um, foreign actors taking on major retailers like Target in 2012, and so on. <clears throat> uh, LulzSec, if you're not familiar with it, because they're, they're no longer really around, um, there's kind of a story there. So LulzSec was a really high profile group. Uh, they had their names on a lot of major data breaches around this time. Um, they went after really big targets, particularly law enforcement and so on. Uh, and they used to basically, they, they, they were really media friendly because they would always do some goofy thing or something, leave a funny ransom note or something behind. Uh, but uh, they were retired, quote unquote, uh, because tons of them got busted. And tons of them got busted because one of their members, a uh, Hector, Hector Javier, uh, last name starts with an M, but I can't remember what it is. Um, born in Puerto Rico, lived in New York, was arrested, and was facing 124 years for hacking, and instead became an FBI informant, and it basically led to the collapse of the group. So as I said, uh, the reason that hacker collectives in the mid, early mid-2010s stopped becoming a thing is because law enforcement, particularly the FBI, uh, learned how to combat that type of crime just as they had before with individual actors. So they learned to infiltrate and compromise these groups in one way or another. Which means, oh, there's some of their uh, symbolism there. Uh, which means uh, that here at the early 2010s, we're actually seeing the end of that era and the beginning of another. And as you can tell from the types of attacks that I'm showing you, uh, this is now more or less the state we currently find the industry because the mid to late 2010s and the early 2020s is now the era of the APT, the nation state actors. That and any who managed to slip through the net of the FBI in these waning days of hacker collectives was smart enough to know that the FBI is only effective on US soil. Right. They can contact international organizations in order to extradite, but they realized that the game was over here in the States itself. And so they, if they wanted to continue operating in the uh, lifestyle to which they've been accustomed, they needed to move to non-extradition countries. And that meant that they needed connections, foreign connections, foreign connections who would not turn them over to law enforcement, which meant some of the most talented hackers, black hat hackers we had in this country at this time, well, now they're going overseas, which means that not only are APTs, state actors, a much bigger thing because cyber warfare is expanding, but it also means that now they and foreign organized crime sources have a fresh new pool of talent, just like Project Paperclip when we brought Nazi scientists over here to the United States to build us atom bombs and rockets. It's a brain drain. Our best and brightest, our best and brightest computer criminals, mind you, but still, 
our most talented computer criminals left. And they were quickly recruited by those who more than willing to make use of their skills. So this is when we begin to see um, Saudi Aramco was attacked. Uh, Slink is still around with LulzSec because 2013 is when that collapsed. Um, social networking sites are being attacked, uh, but now it's instead of being proprietary information and R&D, troop movements and that kind of thing, they really want to get information about um, Americans, users, habits, and so on as part of what we now see and now know, but we weren't quite sure of at the time, is probably part of a very large PSYOPs campaign against our population. The seeds of the misinformation machine. So Tumblr is attacked, uh, the White House computer system and so on. Um, Sony Pictures is attacked by a hacker collective calling themselves Guardians of Peace, probably related to North Korea. Um, then we have in 2015, another huge breach, 21.5 million people. Uh, WikiLeaks happened in 2016. That's, well, they happened before that, uh, but when they uh, did the uh, 2016 DNC email leak, that's when the heat was on them for sure. That's when Julian Assange went into asylum and so on. Um, let's skip forward here, I don't wanna bogged down too much because we're almost out of time. Um, all of this culminates more or less uh, at 2017, which is where I'm going to stop feeding you bullet points here, with the Equifax breach. Now, the Equifax breach at the time in 2017 was... <laughs> now, nobody seemed to care. <laughs> the average person didn't really seem to care when it happened. They didn't seem to understand exactly what was at stake. If you're not familiar with Equifax, here in the United States, if you want to get financing for anything, and of course you do because the way our financial system is set up, you can't actually just buy anything. You go into, uh, you know, con contact a realtor and say, you know, I want to buy this house. I have three hundred thousand dollars in cash. It's going to take you an extra couple of weeks because they think you're a drug dealer or something. Financing is what you do, and then you pay off the loan, and then you get brownie points on your credit score, right? If you want a car, you finance a car, you pay the car off on time, you get brownie points on your credit score. And of course, everybody really wants their credit score to be high because that means you're a good productive person. And if it's really low, it means that you're garbage and you don't belong in the society. Equifax is one of the three credit reporting bureaus that keeps those magic numbers. It's Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. There are others, but those are the three main ones. What that means is that Equifax, along with the other two, uh, basically have all of your information, all of your information. They have your name, they have your uh, addresses going back years and years, they have phone numbers that are attached to you. They also know all of the account numbers with your banks and investments, all of the open lines of credit you have. They know how much you make, they know where you work, so on and so forth. Just a gold mine, a PII. And it was breached completely, completely. Full access. Three, what's the population of the United States? It's about 330 million. Yeah, around there. 324 million people. Individual records were found in that breach. And everything was lost. Now, you might say it can't possibly get much worse than that. Well, last thing I will show you is how it did. Just to contextualize, everything we've been talking about here, all the way from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, the early 2010s, we see data breaches are happening, they're getting bigger and bigger. But this really says it better than I ever could. <laughs> Wait, hold on a sec. <laughs> I'm gonna bury the lead here. Okay, so starting at the bottom, information is beautiful. This chart right here began collecting data in 2004. So this is the just the beginning of the rise of the hacker collective and the death of the individual hacker as we knew them. We got some pretty big breaches here. But as we go up, and here's today. Not a problem that has slowed down. The efficacy of the FBI in combating cybercrime has increased, but only certain types of cybercrime certain actors. And as they say, you know, when the going gets tough, the good go pro, and it just changed the way that they're operating. 
So they're still operating. Targets are bigger than ever. And it hasn't slowed down, not one little bit. All right. We will leave early as mea culpa for going over last time. And we will see you next week.